Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Chowdhury. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, integrating Industry 4.0 in our lean manufacturing uh, environment. So I'm going to change my slide. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, so you kind of have an idea of where I'm coming from, my perspective. Um, I am an industrial engineer. Um, I graduated from uh, Texas Tech University. So if any Red Raiders in the room, then not very many of us in these, in these here parts, I guess. So I am an industrial engineer. I have a master's in biomechanics also from uh, Texas Tech University. I am slowly doing my uh, MBA from uh, West Texas A&M. Um, that's also in uh, Canyon, Texas, right near uh, Lubbock, Texas. Um, as far as for my professional experience, um, I, I'm currently today the Lean Program Manager at Signify for our uh, Americas region. So that means uh, North America, South America. Um, I currently support 16 sites within our region. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do at uh, Signify. Um, but currently, uh, I'm also uh, teaching at Texas State uh, for this fall, uh, Human Factors Engineering. And uh, in the spring, I've taught uh, Lean Six Sigma as well. So my whole background has been in uh, continuous improvement industrial engineering. Um, that's been my core uh, application of my uh, education and all the principles. Uh, and I used to work also in uh, San Angelo, Texas. That's where I started. Um, I started at uh, Ethicon, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. So if you've ever had stitches in your life, more than likely it came from that factory in a very small place in Texas, like two hours from any major interstate. Um, so that site specifically makes um, the world's, 85% uh, of the world's absorbable sutures and probably then some now. So more than likely that's where it came from. Um, it's a fully automated factory, so I've had now experience of both experiencing automation, a fully automated factory, and then where I am today where it's a very um, manual kind of factory. But uh, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background there. Um, one of the key things uh, as far as for my overall responsibilities in driving the lean program at Signify um, I'm currently working on my, my Lean Master certification, which um, is basically equivalent to like your Master Black Belt that you would have for Six Sigma, and I should get that next quarter. So that's, uh, or this, the end of this quarter. So that's, that's been my main experience. Um, as far as uh, what I'll talk to you today, I'm gonna switch the slide. I'll give you a little bit of an overview about uh, Signify, just overall what we do for lean manufacturing deployment. And then, of course, the important one, um, what would be a key topic, is our data-driven automation roadmap. You know, how, are we, how have we been developing this? And then also integrating human-centric automated solutions, because like I said, we are a very manual environment in our Luminaire business. Uh, so that's gonna be, that's something that's a, integrating Industry 4.0 is a big change for this type of an industry. And then also um, from that, as, um, as I've worked with different teams, we've observed, we've collectively observed a lot of challenges for this type of implementation. So I wanted to discuss that as well. So Signify in general, um, if you've probably known it or heard of it, is Philips. It used to be uh, Philips, started in 1891. It was formerly called Philips Lighting. Um, Philips, Royal Philips and Philips Lighting, there was a split or a spin-off company in 2017. Uh, so that's where it became Philips Lighting. Now the site, or now the, the company is called uh, Signify. So if you've seen like Philips air fryers or if you're familiar with Philips uh, Hue products, the lights that um, you can control with your phone, you can sync it to music. Recently we just um, had a, got a deal with Spotify where we're able to do um, incorporate Spotify music um, into our whole uh, connected lighting as well. I'm currently based out of the San Marcos facility, so our neighbors are Amazon and Urban Mining, actually. Um, we uh, are right across the street. Um, we are on 1611 Clovis Barker Road, so maybe you've seen us, maybe you haven't. Um, but the business used to be called uh, Genlight Thomas, and it was sold to Phillips in 2008. Um, and so then in 
as I already mentioned, when there was the split, we got rebranded. Uh, it was an exciting time. Even though we did have COVID last year, we were able to also acquire Cooper Lighting. Cooper Lighting is a fairly large um, lighting company, and just the two companies combined to, to really continue that path of being the world leader in lighting. And then we offer professional lighting solutions um, to many different industries, uh, roadway, street, agriculture, uh, healthcare, consumer, and, and systems and services. So um, we also offer connected lighting. We have a new brand that was launched as Nature Connect. So it's, uh, it's connected lighting within uh, office buildings and office spaces. So it's kind of like our smart lighting. So we're starting to offer a lot of these systems and services to our customers and uh, something that's you know, fairly new um, since uh, uh, traditionally uh, the, what we've always had are lamps and um, you know, outdoor lighting solutions is another one. So in the San Marcos factory, we, where I'm specifically based, we manufacture outdoor lighting solutions. So very, very, very manual, um, and next, I just changed the slide too. Um, very, very manual uh, process. So one of the things that we in Signify we really pride ourselves on is our whole lean deployment um, program. So I, was, I don't know, I can't ever assume, can you just show me a raise of hands if you know about lean and lean manufacturing? So yes, okay. So some, okay, good. So we have lean in the office and we have lean manufacturing. Um, traditionally, everyone thinks of lean as lean in a shop floor environment or in a, in a factory setting but we do have both. Um, one of the things that we have as part of our lean roadmap is uh, we, we have a very distinct process that we follow in what we call our lean maturity in performance model. So that's our multi-step approach to lean. And in the last couple years, uh, we've really focused in on industry 4.0. So that's something very new to signify in terms of digitalization. That's one of our that's one of our um, you know, core initiatives is digitalization and how are we gonna get there? So as we've developed, especially on our lean manufacturing side, we've had to be quite creative in how we implement this uh, and especially with sites in our uh, Americas region where we do have a lot of job shop type of work, manual type of work. So this can be quite challenging when we're looking at automation in our factories. So just to give you a high-level overview of how we do lean in our, um, in our business. So one of the things we're always looking for is, you know, are we committed? You know, are we, are we committed to doing lean? Are we committed to um, looking at a three to five year roadmap and, and really go, being on that journey? You know, not looking for, you know, results uh, instantly, but do we have a vision? Um, the next part of our phase is that we always want to start in a very small area. We test you know, a lot of proof of concept. Uh, so this is where we look at a lot of our lean tools, lean behaviors, and do we have a real good proof of concept um, to then deploy site-wide. And then that's where we call what we, uh, is like our, we call our setting a strong foundation. So this is where we're really optimizing our uh, processes. Uh, we need to have very robust processes and developing them at this point in the uh, lean journey. Uh, and this is where we start really looking at how we're able to create a vision state for a factory. And creating that vision state, creating those robust processes, and starting to create optimal layouts is really what helps us set the stage to integrate industry 4.0 type of concepts. Because one of the main things that we don't want to do, and something, if you're a lean guru, you never want to automate waste. And that is, uh, that is, like, the, is like an evil thing to do um, because it's a lot of time and money that you spend. You don't want to automate you know, uh, an inefficient process because that's not the point. The point is to help improve our safety, number one, uh, quality and productivity, but of course with the, uh, with the human in mind. It's supposed to be human-aided automation. So when we start to introduce uh, smart manufacturing, we can do that in our phase two but we really like to do that more in our phase three where we have stable, robust processes. And then as we mature in our lean journey, this is where we can start looking at our office areas. 
So when you're looking at um, when you're looking at some of the RPA type of automation in your office areas, you know any type of um, customer interfacing tools, uh, supply chain. So in our office processes, we're looking at where we can automate some of those processes as well, and implement uh, that RPA type of uh, methodology. Um, we also look where we focus on uh, suppliers as well, and really looking at uh, our overall value stream flow. And that should have been something that is the foundation built in the previous phase. And then finally in our last phase, this is where we start, you know, you're a world-class factory, you're outperforming, um, and then you start to set that new vision of excellence and you go through the whole cycle over and over. And you just keep doing that as that is continuous improvement. So introduction of smart manufacturing um, is something that has been fairly new. So I'm changing the slide. Uh, so we have what we call building a data-driven automation roadmap, since we want to make sure everything that we do comes from, comes from a good data set. We don't want to just go with the fad, yeah, it's nice to have a bunch of AGVs or the automated guided, automated guided vehicles, that's nice. Um, maybe you have cobots in the factory. Some, some factories might have that and another site sees it, or maybe you go benchmark and then you say, oh, that's really cool, let's, let's add that too. Um, let's do pick to light. So in our warehousing, as we want to, um, you know, increase our our picking of material speed, let's do that. But we don't want to just pick things willy nilly. We want to make sure everything that we pick has a purpose, and is actually going to help us and create value in our factory, and really take those repetitive processes and change them more to automated processes, and then leave the human to be able to do more of the critical thinking problem solving, and that's where you really start to see the benefit of um, really um, getting your high-performing work teams. So I want to go over just a, what we've done as an approach. So something I've developed um, in the, the last few months, um, kind of born out of necessity, is uh, really looking at a way to combine some of our lean tools and looking at um, some of our human-centric guided guidelines and principles to come up with a method and a process to identify where we can implement automation, especially in, like I said, if, with the scope of what what I've been interacting with in the, over the last eight years with Signify is a very, very manual environment and just a, you know, like novice to automation in general. I'm going to change the slide. So one of the things we did a workshop, and I tested this out with... Um, the same Arco site, but we looked at um, you know human factors engineering principles, where we really looked at you know where, and this kind of giving the whole team a uh, background um, of of what of what we need to think about as we're looking at automated solutions. So one looking at human factors engineering uh, topics, uh, strengths of humans versus strength of machines. You know that's one thing that we wanted to take a look at, um, identifying in our process where we have a lot of cognitive effort. Same with the uh, physically taxing type of labor, ergonomics, since we are very manual, um, a lot of manual material handling goes on. Um, we do have a lot of repetitive motions, a lot of walking um, in some cases, and, and that's where when you're looking at optimizing your processes and your layout, you can almost kind of preemptively eliminate that up front, but still some of that does go on. Then we look at a lot of our biomechanics principles, lifting and lowering of heavy objects, um, especially when we get to some of our assembly lines in a lot of our different sites. Fixtures that people physically pick up and move are actually quite heavy. They probably range anywhere um, from a raw material around 26, 30 pounds. When you start to get them fully loaded with LEDs, drivers, screws, and all the hardware, it's going to be around 45 or 50 pounds. That's a lot. And that's a lot for a person to repetitively do for 10-hour days. And we used to do eight-hour days, but now think 10-hour days because we're going to the whole trend of the four-day work week. So that's something that, it, it, you know, when, especially when you have an aging workforce, because we have a lot of people in our factories across all of our sites who've been with the company 30, 40 years, and then we're constantly pushing them to do more and more and more. We need to start having some of these um, automated interventions to help, you know, keep our workers safe, still have maintained you know, good quality, and of course, improve the productivity. So I'm changing this again. 
So leveraging our lean manufacturing tools, some of the things that we look at when we're actually mapping processes, we have spaghetti diagrams. That could be from the perspective of activity of the, peop of the person. You can follow the person. And it could be the perspective of activity of the product, following the material. We also use tools such as value stream mapping. Um, if you're not familiar with value stream mapping, value stream mapping is just going to give you an overall view of uh, flow of material and information in your factory. So how do different departments communicate? And then also, how do different materials flow from start to finish? And you define the scope. It could be an end-to-end -end process, or it could be just from your shop floor um, manufacturing floor perspective. So when you pick the part, it follows itself all the way to through shipping. And then we wanted to incorporate, too, um, the financial assessment part of it, because that's the most important. These are all nice ideas, but then how do we um, solidify this as an idea to then sell to you know, our head of operations to say, hey, we need money to then implement such, a, such an automated solution. So this is when we're looking at the whole benefit to cost ratio. And one of the things when you look at value stream mapping, you're always looking at the value add processes versus the non-value add processes in terms of process times. And then you can get a percentage. So what we want to do here, and I'll show you, um, is looking at from a benefit to cost ratio, kind of the same concept where your value add is going to be your benefit and your non-value add is basically going to be your cost. And we want that overall view to look, you know, to be greater than one. So the whole idea is to then also look at it from a holistic perspective, not just point efficiency within the different processes. So the output of this is a data-driven automation roadmap. And of course, this has to be done with the cross-functional team. I'm going to switch the slide. Um, so typically, we kind of, I just kind of already touched on a lot of this, but one of the things that we do is anytime we've done value stream mapping exercises in general, we're always going to go out to the shop floor as a team. We do this in all of our different sites, but in this case, we're going to look at it from the human perspective. Uh, where is the person walking? Where is the person doing repetitive tasks, lifting heavy objects, awkward postures, bending, push-pull, overly physically taxing type of sequences? Where are all the manual processes? So we've got a lot of transcribing of, of part numbers on paper or on tape to label. We might have a lot of um, processes where we're having to constantly pick the same part. Um, or you know, with different orders that we might have, um, we're always having to go through. And it, depending upon how your warehouse is optimally laid out, you're having to constantly search and detect you know, where different parts are to pick for that order. Uh, so we want to look at all of those different uh, activities, cognitive efforts. And then from there, what we are doing is I've created all the different, uh, oh, sorry, I need to switch the slide. And so from there, we'll, we'll start to do our mapping with what we call manual touch points. So all of those different inputs that we get from observation, um, studies, and all the mapping, we'll start to map it with manual touch points. And then when we are going through as a workshop doing this analysis to start to identify automation as part of our future roadmap then, or our future vision, then we want to look at all the automated icons. So anything where we're putting stuff into a computer um, or if we're bringing stuff into receiving, where can we scan all of, the, where can we use barcode scanning to help with that process so we're not doing any type of paper transactions. Let me change the slide. So this is just an example. Um, I do have a layout that's behind this, but just to keep it you know, very general. So, this is, so what you typically would do is you take a whole layout of your factory. You're going to map your main artery and all those different touch points that I mentioned. You're going to map all those manual touch points within the entire shop floor. You can do something separate too for an office environment, um, but this was just a start to look at it from a shop floor perspective. And of course, as you go through, you're going to have to go deeper into each of the processes or the sub-processes, such as receiving, uh, maybe your paint line, how you do put-aways um, of material, how you're going to pick material, how you're going to bring it to the production lines. And then even within the production lines, there's lots of opportunities that you can define as well with the same type of approach. And then what we do is um, we'll start to look at you know, based on our current state value stream maps, we'll be able to understand too where we have our benefit, 
So if I change to the next slide, just an example, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, all the automated icons, where do we have our benefits of, if we put an automated solution in place, then what's gonna be the return on investment? And then from there, we can also prioritize based on a trend that we might possibly see within the end-to-end uh, -end mapping, you know, where do we have multiple opportunities to put the same solution in place? Um, and then from there, we can start to justify, you know, how often, uh, based on our volumes, how often we'll be able to use the new technology and will that be cost effective? And then what we typically do is we get all these results. And if you're familiar with Lean, you'll know that we always do strategic planning. From strategic planning, we do what we call our Hoshin. That's going to be something that we go through and define all of our projects for the next year. So this at least helps us identify where those opportunities are. And it's kind of a tool to help us identify where automation opportunities are. Um, and then help prioritize them based on the payback when we do our business cases. And then that can fit into our three to five year strategy. And of course, how that then ties and connects to all of our overarching um, business priorities that we might get from our CEO. So everything connects together. And then all of these go into individual factory, three to five year roadmaps for what they plan to do as vision state. Um, and then that all ties to the, our, let's say our 20, 2024 North Star vision. And so that's, that's how we do this um, in, in our factories. I changed it again. Um, so some of the things that we've noticed uh, is challenges. We do these exercises the hardest part is then getting the capital to do these activities, um, especially in our luminaires business where we are a very uh, high mix, low volume environment. It is, it is hard to do a lot of our business case justifications. So that is, that is one challenge. Also, we also have, um, you know, sites in Canada and US are gonna be more expensive in labor, whereas you have sites in Mexico, or maybe in South America, labor's not very expensive, but you have a lot of cost in terms of your material or your, your bomb costs, um, your bill of material costs. So when we look at automation from that perspective, it's also hard for them to justify as well because it's not helping with a labor reduction need. Instead, they're looking more at needs of, uh, how do we use automation uh, as far as need of the product, you know, from the needs of the product's perspective. How do we make sure we have really good quality? And maybe we can look at automated solutions from that perspective instead, instead of just cost savings perspective. So that's something that's been very challenging for, for all of our sites. Um, also, another type of environment of whether you have a very manual, semi-automated, or fully automated, because a lot of our lamps factories, they're all fully automated, but yet they're still, we still have challenges there as well. Um, but mainly it's going to be in our make-to-order job shops where finding automation, so automated solutions and implementing them are tough. But we might look at low-cost intelligent automation as well. Things that we're looking at like uh, siliconing. You know, we do a lot of repetitive tasks with siliconing, securing fasteners or securing LED boards to uh, heat sinks where we're looking at um, even, some of that, even some of our... Uh, packaging, where can we do some automated um, activities there? But with that job shop, you've got so many different uh, applications of, and, and ways of working, it can be quite tough. But um, we do have a forum that we, we go through and we look at, um, especially with best practice sharing. We can look at all of our sites and probably Europe is gonna be our most advanced region when it comes to automation. So we do have what we call a global smart manufacturing council where we can use that forum to share best practices, share you know, what type of automated solutions are you putting in your factory, share um, who the vendors are so we can maybe team up and have better buying power. Um, and then we also can do, we also have a regional smart manufacturing steering committee which is what I, I do. Um, and so we looked and see, okay, we all want to put in uh, digital work instructions, we all want to put in AGVs because it makes sense. 
where can we go to one vendor and have some maybe some buying power there to help reduce costs? Where can we might where maybe are we able to share automated solutions? Like if we want to reduce our inventory of cardboard boxes, if we want to go to a pack size solution, who and maybe one of our sites can take that that piece of equipment and then distribute to the rest of our our sites. So we have to get very, very creative nonetheless. Um, and then one of the major big challenges is always going to be IT infrastructure, um, overall skill set. Uh, you know, as things have rapidly been progressing and with technology, skill set is also one. We always think, oh, IT can do everything, but um, maybe there, there's, there, we also have some gaps too in our IT skill set. Um, so the continuing education uh, of some of people that have been there a long time is also very important to make sure we support that as well. And then just overall corporate security. You always get the, you know, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, and that forces people to go look at homegrown solutions, and then they yell at you about that as well. So that's, there's, always, there's always something. But uh, the, whole, the whole point here is that we had to get creative in how we look at how we're going to do automation. We always want to do it in a very methodical way. We always want to support the human. And then we need to make sure that when we do these things, it's going to add value. We don't automate waste. And that when we prioritize what we implement, it's going to be in such a way that's going to give the biggest payback as much as possible. So that was my main message. So thank you. And that is all I have. So. Thank you.